Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Oh, yeah, that's better. <laughs> there we go. Uh, welcome to the uh, November 6, 2022, Mound Science and Energy Museum Seminar. Uh, I'm your host, Bob Bowman, and tonight I'm also your speaker. And our pre presentation tonight is going to be on the diverse role of hydrogen and metal hydride in space missions. And what I'm going to cover over the next hour or so uh, the following topics. Introduction to hydrogen and metal hydride, some basics. An overview of roles of hydrogen in space. Hydrogen is used in a rocket, as rocket fuel. Uh, hydrogen uses on onboard power system in spacecraft. These are particularly fuel cells and nickel hydrogen batteries, where hydrogen is used. The first use of a metal hydride on a space mission. Describe that. And then I'm going to talk about cryogenic applications of uh, hydrogen in satellites. This is when it's want you, you want something really cold. Space is not always cold enough. Sometimes you want it colder than that. Uh, finally, I'm, well not finally, I'm then going to get some possible future role of hydrogen, some of which have been future roles for over 60 years. But uh, I'll get to that. And then finally, a few comments, wrap up, and discussion if you wish. Okay. So what are some basic properties of hydrogen? First, hydrogen is the most common element in the universe. It's everywhere in the universe, not everywhere on Earth. It's the lightest, lightest element, has a, a single atomic mass unit, that is one proton and one electron. And it's also the least dense gas of anything uh, that exists. Hydrogen does make up 13.5% of the atoms on Earth. It's the third most abundant. However, because it's light, it's only about 0.75% of the weight of the Earth's crust. It's none down in the core. That's all iron and other hot and molten stuff. But it is the ninth most abundant. Now, there are three kinds of hydrogen that are isotopes. They all have a single proton. Uh, let's see, this point this out? Yeah, it kind of works. Uh, in principle, I could use the... Cursor, but a, so a single proton, deuterium has a single neutron, about the same mass of proton, and that's deuterium. Now, protium, high, plain hydrogen, is 99.985% of all hydrogen, and the only 0.15% is deuterium. But there's a third radioactive isotope called tritium. It has two, two neutrons and one proton. Its half-life is only about 12 years. But for mountain laboratory, tritium has a special place, a long history, but I'm not covering that today. I've talked about it in a couple of other talks in years past. But to be complete, I always want to mention tritium. Okay, now the characteristics of, of hydrogen is that the hydrogen is a diatomic gas. That is, a stable form of hydrogen are two atoms bonded together. The simplest chemical bond, the number one, but it's extremely reactive and forms a vast number of chemical compounds. You know, this thing called water our bodies, animals, plants, much, many other things have hydrogen in them. Now, molecular hydrogen doesn't exist very much in, 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 as a free species because it's so reactive. It's, the molecular hydrogen is very light and very flammable. Now, hydrogen is in methane, which is natural gas, and in fact methane is the primary source of almost all hydrogen that has been used uh, in the world, in space, for, for decades. There is also water, ice, steam, has H2O. It's ice like, or snow, it's liquid, and it's, of course, gas, water vapor. And now, uh, you can uh, produce hydrogen by chemical reactions. The, as I mentioned, the largest one is from methane by what's called steam reformation, high temperature with catalyst, and you'll make carbon monoxide with water, and then you'll make carbon dioxide, and you'll have hydrogen. Then you capture the hydrogen, and that's what you do for the reactions of hydrogen to use it in all the applications. Okay, so what's going on here? Ah, sneaky. Okay, you never trust what you put in PowerPoint. Sometimes it does something different. Okay, metal hydrides are usually solids. Most that we have been interested in are solid, although there are a few liquids and even a few gases. But they're typically identified as 
uh, solids formed by the reaction of hydrogen gas and metal. And there's two primary ways. That is, you take a solid metal and put it in hydrogen gas. It will absorb that hydrogen and form a compound. A not what they call not use a non-stoichiometric. That is, the amount of hydrogen can vary depending on lots of factors. But it also releases a lot of heat. It's an exothermic process. So that heat is both can be useful, but it's also a detriment. The other way to make hydrogen is an electrochemical process. That is, you take a metal in a water solution, you add electrons by a, from a battery source or somewhere else, you will disassociate the water into hydroxyl and hydrogen uh, uh, cations, and it will be absorbed in the material, leaving along uh, OH, hydroxyl, becomes basic. So these are the two primary uh, ways you make metal hydride, and the properties of metal hydrides are determined by the particular combination of metals. Now, a schematic picture of what happened. So we have a, 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 a drawing, a schematic of, of a cube of, of metal atoms. It could be a single metal, it could be a lot. And you have here, you have hydrogen gas on one side, as an example of that reaction I talked about. It strikes on the surface. If the energetics are right, it will break apart into atoms that will dissolve in the surface. And then, in order to get thermodynamic equilibrium, it will diffuse in the solid and form in what are called interstitial sites. And it holes in the metal atoms. Metal atoms are like spheres. They have space in between them. Hydrogen usually doesn't have enough space, so it pushes the metal atoms apart. And that's called the volume expansion. Lots of interesting things. Now, you can equally Take an electrolyte with now water, uh, blue is oxygen too. You bring it, you add that chemical potential, it breaks it up, it goes in. There are compounds that you can make both electrochemically and gas phase, others you can't. Now, that's the simple one shot schematic. I'm showing you the family tree of metal hydrides and alloys. And this family tree has hundreds of compounds, phases that are known. Uh, you can start with a pure element. Again, this is that reaction of, of a, a metal alloy intermetallic with some hydrogen, forms some compound, releases heat. The same with the battery. You put, uh, uh, some kind of comp this is a complex. You have some metal A and a metal M, and it forms a compound, uh, reacts, and this is uh, called a complex hydride. This is lithium borohydride. For example, there's a whole series of those. This is an example of an interstitial compound. That's lanthanum nickel 5, that is, layers of lanthanum and nickel. Uh, hydrogen goes into the site. And as you see, there's a whole family tree. Uh, the A metals that are reactive with hydrogen are things like lithium, magnesium, and calcium, yttrium, rare earths. Metals that don't easily react with hydrogen are things like iron, cobalt, nickel. But again, by combinations of those, you can alter the properties, you get lots of things you want or don't want. So uh, that's the, the beauty and the complexity of metal hydride. You can get a lot of stuff. You also get a lot of things you don't want, but you, that's what you do research for. And that's what I spend the better part, well, over 50 years looking at for different applications. But now that I've given you a little background on hydrogen, metal hydride, maybe not enough you need, but it's what you're going to get tonight, we talk about the role of hydrogen and how it's used. Uh, this is a, a chart and uh, in space flight. This is first thing is launch vehicles, and these are expendables, gramjet. These are things that were hydrogen used as a rocket fuel. Uh, there are power systems I mentioned early on: fuel cells, what are nickel metal hydride batteries. There are cryogenic cooling, and as I'll explain further in a few minutes. Hydrogen has uh, one of the lowest uh, condensation points, that is when the temperature with, it becomes a liquid, also when it's a solid, so if you're having that cold, you can cool things off. There are uh, ways to do that. One is JT, JT is Joule Thompson. That was a technique discovered in the early 19th century, late 18th century, of expanding gases and causing liquefaction. That's what developed the cryogenic industry of all kinds of things from liquid nitrogen, liquid air, and all kinds of other things. But hydrogen was one of those. There's also uses as a solid cryogen. That is, you make solid hydrogen and you use it to make something cold. And there's the absorption cryocores, which is 
what I spend about 30 years working on one way or the other. And these are these use different metal hydrides. And I will elaborate a bit more on those as we get further into the talk. Now, there's been specialized uses for hydrogen, which I'm going to talk a little bit about. These are miscellaneous. One is you can take hydrogen that you store and react it with oxygen from some source and make water, which is very handy when you're on the space station or the shuttle and you can't carry along enough water to drink and use for the bathroom and everything else you want to do. You can make it using hydrogen in a reaction. And it's been done that way since the, before the Apollo program. You can store reference gas where the metal hydrides, for example, uh, release extremely pure hydrogen, which you can then use in experiments to measure the composition on other planets or on the moon. And there's an example where I'll show that, that how that's being used. And then there's a, a thermal control device, device called the gas gap heat switch. That's a way to have a variable insulator. If you have it, uh, a gas gap with a high vacuum, it, it's like a vacuum door. You can't conduct heat. You put a little hydrogen in because it has a high thermal conductive, then it's conductive. And you can cycle it with time. So if you do thermal cycling system, it allows you to, to do that. And we actually used that on a space mission uh, about 10 years ago. Now, I highlight in rosy pink future roles. Okay, it's been looked at for a long time of thermal control, extra vehicular suits, things like you know Mars suits on the um, moon or Mars. It was looked at quite a bit in the 70s and 80s. As far as I know, no one really used it, but it's still technically feasible. There's also what's called in situ resource utilization. That is going to another planet that doesn't have hydrogen or water. Can you make it? Use it doesn't have uh, high fuel like methane or, or, or natural or free hydrogen, you can take hydrogen and bring it there and make the make fuel, uh, make propellant, actually react it to make convert carbon dioxide like they have on, on uh, Mars into oxygen. That people don't breathe carbon dioxide, you know, it fixes them, yeah, whatever. But oxygen you can breathe. You bring hydrogen there, you can make oxygen, which is really handy. Uh, and then there's nuclear propulsion, the fission-based uh, nuclear propulsion and fusion-based. So these are things I'm going to cover to some degree, but the first thing I'm going to start with is what's demonstrated role for hydrogen. And the number one biggest quantity is hydrogen as rocket fuel. Uh, this is the uh, space shuttle Endeavour being launched in uh, uh, 1996. It's special to me because I had a, uh, an instrument that flew on this space shuttle mission and it more or less worked and I'm going to describe it a little later. Life's complicated in, in space science. So, hydrogen has been used to launch spacecraft since 1966. It wasn't the first rocket fuel but it's in many ways the most versatile and widely used. And the reason is there's a parameter that's very important to how efficient a rocket fuel, and that's called the specific impulse, indicated by the symbol ISP. Now, ISP is, is, is approximately the relationship of TC, which is the chamber temperature, divided by the exhaust product mass over the square root. And if you take liquid hydrogen and burn it with liquid oxygen, and it's it represented by a number, seconds, it's just basically a, a correlation number. Liquid hydrogen goes from about 366 to 452 seconds. And this is what space shuttle used. Uh, the engines on the new SLS space launch system, uh, of which one launched today. Uh, liquid methane is about 330, 350. SpaceX uses that on the Raptor engine. Uh, I rub in on uh, Oh, I can't think of his name now because I'm so fed up with him. But uh, the billionaire rich guy. Musk. Musk. Elon, Elon Musk. Musk. Yeah. He won't use hydrogen in any of his space, or SpaceX or anywhere else. He doesn't like hydrogen. Uh, he only uses methane and solid rocket fuel. Kerosene. So, anyway. Kerosene. Yeah. He doesn't use solid, he uses kerosene or methane. Yeah, kerosene and, 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 and methanol and, and methane for his second stages. 
but these don't. Now, solid rocket uh, propellants, these are uh, a rocket propellant one. This is kerosene mixture, the liquid organic, liquid one. They're about 280 to 300. Now, solid boosters, these are the solid uh, booster rocket fuel guys. They get about 260. Those are the booster on shuttle, also on Artemis. These are the ones that use, because what they have is not so high of a splitting impulse, but they have great thrust. And when you've got to clear the Earth and get out of Earth's atmosphere, that's what they're used for. Okay, so we're going to talk for the next few minutes about liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen stages, and they are cryogenic, bipropellant rocket fuel. The fuel is liquid hydrogen, and it reacts with liquid oxygen, and for example, this is delta two, most of the delta six. And the early one, they used pressure. They would have a, a liquid hydrogen in big tanks, liquid oxygen in big tank. They would have a pressurized helium gas that would open valves and launch and push it out at about 100 pounds per square inch out the engine and burn it. Uh, and so uh, they would burn these, take water that would be ejected out. Uh, the updated, more efficient models that have been used in the Space Shuttle, Ariane 5, and now in the Artemis uh, series, they, they use pumps. They have helium, but they also use uh, pumps to pump the hydrogen from the fuel tank into the engine, so you now have a pressure of 1,000 PSI, 10 times higher pressure. Well, guess what? You get more energy out, faster out, and can do the bigger projects, bigger objects. So that's the basic in a, in, a, in a schematic of the two primary types of liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen uh, rocket engines. Now, as I was had stated earlier, this is by far the most common role of hydrogen has been launching vehicles. The first really big one was Saturn V. You know, Apollo, Skylab. They had two liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen stages. And Ariane 4, uh, 4 was a French system that launched lots of telecommunications. They had a single uh, liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen shape. The space shuttle actually had three stages. They had a 135 launches, two failures. You probably remember those. They're big news. Uh, but the Atlas Centaur, which was the earliest one to use hydrogen, the Atlas, Atlas 3, Titan 4, Ariane, Ariane 5 is the... Uh, uh, largest uh, uh, European rocket, and then China uses it, Russia uses it, Japan uses it. There's been over 500 uh, launches using hydrogen at one or more stages. So, you know, it's it's really the thing. Now, this is the space shuttle, which is you know retired now, what almost 15 years, maybe a little over. And then this is a schematic. So this is a orbiter of this space shuttle. These are the two solid boosters. The, there are three engines here. Those are the, and this big fat tank is where the liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen are stored. And, and during a single launch, they'll use 230,000 kilograms, 230 metric tons of hydrogen in a single launch. That's a bunch of gas. And so, and they, they all use that. Now, the new program that the United States have been pushing, NASA, is the Artemis program, and the objective is to get people back to the moon by the late 20s, maybe Mars in the 30s, and they're going to use two liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen stages. The first test occurred today at 1:45, 1:46, and 46, 47 in the morning. It launched, and I'm going to actually show you that video because I figured most of you were sleeping didn't pay a bit of attention. But. Uh, so uh, this is the uh, a schematic of the Artemis One with the rocket engine. There are four of these engines. These are uh, made by uh, Aerojet Rocketdyne. They are basically upgraded leftovers from the space shuttle program. They refitted them, re redesigned them. Each one of these engines has four turbo pumps really big turbo. The main combustion center, which is right in here, where, where it burns right inside there. The nozzle that throws it out, and then there's a engine controller buried up in here 
there to, to control the, the system. Now, as I said, it took off the first one today, lifted off from the Launch Space Center 39B in Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Come a little later. Now we're arming the, the Orion Ascent Pyros and transfer to internal power. The launch abort system, or LAS jettison motor, is now armed. On this flight, the abort motor is inactive because there is no crew on board. Up next is the flight termination system, or FTS, which gives the Space Force the ability to destruct the rocket if it goes in the wrong direction. Let's listen in for that. GLS is go for FTS arm. The flight termination system is now armed. Coming up at 4 minutes and 40 seconds, a big moment. This is where the RS-25 engines and their bleed go to high flow. It's been a little tricky to dial in. GLS is go for LH-2 high flow bleed check. Good word, we've passed that. The cryo team got the LH2 engine bleed pressure loop dialed in. They are now at the right temperature for launch. Countdown continues. T minus four minutes, 15 seconds. Up next, GLS fires up the KPUs. Those are high speed turbines which provide pressure to hydraulic pumps that steer the RS 25s. Stands for core stage auxiliary power unit start. GLS is go for core stage APU start. That now leads to the thrust vector control test at T minus 2 minutes and 30 seconds. That can proceed now, and we will see the engine's gimbal at the bottom of the core stage. At T minus three minutes and 10 seconds, you will hear the go for purge sequence four. That's a helium purge of the four core stage engines downstream of the propellant valve, getting the air and moisture out. GLS is go for purge sequence four. And in just a few seconds, GLS will close the core stage locks vent, liquid oxygen, the white vapor cloud caused from the super cold gaseous oxygen condensing the water in the atmosphere will disappear. You see it coming out there now. And there it goes, it's closed. Locks vent closed, pressure rising in the core stage locks tank to flight levels. Coming up in 15 seconds, look for that thrust vector control actuator test. Engines will gimbal. And there they go. The four core stage RS-25 engines gimbling around, testing the ability to steer the rocket into space. They will operate at 109% performance. Each RS-25 throwing down a half million pounds of thrust. All four, two million pounds. All together with the boosters, 8.8 .8 million pounds of thrust. GLS is good for upper stage to internal power. Now the upper stage has gone to internal power. So power is removed from the rocket's upper stage, the ICPS, and it's been switched to battery power. The same milestone is coming up for the core stage at T minus one minute and 30 seconds. GLS is go for core stage to internal power. The rocket's core stage, which houses the three flight computers, is now on battery power. So there is no more hold time available because there's no more margin on the battery. So if we hold, have a hold, we'd have to recycle back to T minus 10 minutes and recharge those batteries. The count continues. A note now, shortly after liftoff, One minute. Shortly after liftoff, Mission Control Houston will take control of the rocket, and my colleague, Leah Cheshire, will take over commentary. 
T minus 50 seconds and counting. Coming up at T minus 33 seconds, the GLS will hand off control to the ALS. This is the autonomous launch sequencer on board the rocket. It will take over command and control of the rocket. But the ALS will check, make sure there's no holds coming from the ground up until T minus two GLS, seconds. GLS, go for ALS. And we are go for ALS. The space launch system is now counting down to lift off of Orion on its maiden voyage to the moon. Launch team can no longer recycle the count. Sound suppressor water now flowing 15. under the ML. And here we go. 10. Hydrogen burnoff igniters initiated. Seven, six, five, four stage engine start. Three, two, one. Boosters in ignition. And liftoff of Artemis One. We rise together back to the moon and beyond. on the core stage and two solid rocket boosters now propelling the vehicle at 128 miles per hour. Hearing good, con good control on the roll from teams of Mission Control Houston. All good calls so far. Now 30 seconds into the flight of Artemis 1. First milestone will be forward the vehicle to pass through max Q at about 1 minute and 9 seconds into launch. This is the greatest period of atmospheric force on the rocket. traveling 607 miles per hour. You're looking at 8.8 .8 million pounds of maximum thrust. Quiet here in the loops in mission control. Four core stage engines are throttling down ahead of passing through max Q. seconds into the flight, traveling at 1,420 miles per hour. The four core stage engines are back at maximum thrust. The next major milestone will be for the solid rocket boosters to cut off and jettison at about 2 minutes and 11 seconds into the flight, so about 30 seconds from now. Again, quiet here in Mission Control Houston as teams continue monitoring the flight of Artemis 1. We're now 16 miles downrange from the launch pad at Kennedy Space Center, traveling over 2,800 miles per hour. Standing by for solid rocket booster jettison and shortly thereafter. confirmation that the solid rocket boosters have separated these 177 foot boosters. Now the core stage continues to power the flight of Orion, all four RS-25 engines firing, traveling over 3,400 miles per hour, 46 miles downrange. Two minutes and 36 seconds into the flight. Hearing nominal calls here in Mission Control Houston. We've still got four good engines on the core stage. Next up, we'll be looking for the service module fairing to separate. This is three 15 by 15 foot fairing panels, providing structural support, protecting the service module. Those will separate at about three minutes and 11 seconds into flight, and very shortly thereafter will be followed by the launch abort system separation. Just over three minutes into the flight of Artemis 1, now traveling over 4,060 miles per hour, 83 miles downrange. We just had confirmation that the service module fairing has separated. And that the launch abort system pyros have fired, separating those from Orion as well. For future crew members. We just heard the call for three engine press, meaning if SLS were to lose an engine at this point in the mission, we could still achieve a nominal mission. We would just have an extended main engine cutoff time. However, we still have four good engines, all at maximum thrust right now, powering the first flight of Artemis at 5,200 miles per hour, 148 miles downrange.
We're four minutes and 16 seconds into the flight of Artemis 1. So far, we've had a clean ascent. We saw those solid rocket boosters jettison about two minutes and 11 seconds after liftoff. Shortly after, we had the service module panels fairings separate, as well as the launch abort system. The launch abort system was inert for this flight, except to perform this separation. Those four core stage engines will continue to fire and power the flight of Artemis 1, now traveling over 6,800 miles per hour, 229 miles downrange. Booster flight controller reports that the engines are looking good. Our core stage main engine cutoff time is about eight minutes and three seconds. We are now at five minutes and 11 seconds into the flight, 7,656 7, miles per hour. Again, four good core stage engines, those four RS-25 engines. The last time those core stage engines flew, they were taking space shuttles to orbit, and now with upgraded capabilities, they're launching the future of human spaceflight. Five minutes, 42 seconds into the mission. We are now traveling 8,800 miles per hour, 345 miles downrange from the launch pad at Kennedy Space Center. Again, we are anticipating core stage main engine cutoff at about eight minutes and three seconds. And about 10 seconds later, we'll see core stage separation, at which point Orion and the interim cryogenic propulsion stage will be flying free. Now traveling over 10,000 miles per hour, six minutes and 15 seconds into the flight of Artemis 1, 427 miles downrange. Quiet here on the loops in Mission Control Houston. Teams continue to monitor this first flight. About a minute and a half now until that core stage main engine cutoff time. Our four core stage engines continue to fire maximum thrust. Coming up on seven minutes since launch today, now traveling over 12,800 miles per hour, 563 miles downrange. Again, still quiet here in Mission Control, Houston. As we prepare for main engine cutoff, the four RS-25 engines are beginning to throttle down. Thirty seconds now until core stage main engine cutoff. All four engines continue to throttle down. Now seven minutes, 45 seconds into the flight, traveling over 16,000 miles per hour. Continuing to hear good calls here in Mission Control Houston. We're standing by for core stage main engine cutoff. And we have confirmation of core stage main engine cutoff, Orion, and it's now in Earth's orbit. The flight dynamics officer reports that we have a nominal main engine cutoff, and we just heard the call for core stage separation. This is the mission. <clears throat> After that booster, here we are in Earth orbit. It's now using the second engine. There's a rocket engine, a single one, on the on the Orion. Uh, satellite. That's the main part of the satellite. And what it's going to do, it's going to head toward the moon. First time anybody been to the moon in 40 years. I mean, Chinese went around it, but they're not landing. The plan is they're going to go around the moon, do another orbit out here, cause a, a, a retro, uh, a distant retro, and then we'll use a combination of onboard propellant, which are not hydrogen propellant. They jettison about a uh, hour and a half in the flight, the last, the second hydrogen-oxygen stage. Now it's on board 
I think hydraulic uh, propellants and stuff. That will do the rest of it, because it's way out in space, not much gravity, but it will do the, the stuff. So, so this is that Orion spacecraft and its rocket engine. Yeah. If you remember a few slides back, we had a, had a big slide. This is the upper part. This is the R11-10 uh, stage. That's been one that was used up on second stage for Titans and many other U.S. missiles. And at one hour and 53 minutes, it's separated. And if I'm lucky, maybe it will show this. The RL-10 was the first hydrogen to fly in space. Yes. That well, was on the stage launched in 63, and they still yes. fly it. Yeah. The most successful well, the, engine. Yeah. But it's, it has no fuel left. Yeah. This is not working, so. <laughs> but I have a link, so. But again, it explains that this will burn for, uh, about a, a, another, I want to say half hour, and then it will be jettisoned, and then it or will left. Now that's that's the first flight to demonstrate this technology that NASA did. But NASA is not the only game in town. Uh, the uh, uh, Jeff Bezos has the uh, Blue Origin, and guess what? They're using hydrogen stages. They're having three different versions, and they've done ground demonstrations of liquefaction, altering how they do hydrogen liquefaction. Uh, they have engine similar to one. That been, that's a ground test of their uh, engine. This is a launch using the uh, BE-3 uh, liquid oxygen hydrogen engine. Hasn't been fully system tested, planned to do it. Next year, maybe. So, to kind of wrap up the kinds of satellites that have been used. This is the, on the far right, is the Apollo uh, uh, Saturn V mission rockets. Those are the size of the Blue Origins. These are the NASA heavy lifter. These are the ones that have been, for the last 30 years, been doing missions to put satellites up, spy things. SpaceX has no hydrogen in their systems. Uh, the, there's Chinese, each of them use the Ariane 4, Ariane 5. Uh, I had the one satellite went off on an Ariane 5 about uh, 12 or 13 years ago. I worked on instruments, so I didn't even go see it launch. That's one of the disadvantages you work on instruments. You don't get to see the really fun stuff. So, in summary on liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen technology, it is large scale and very expensive. The, uh, these are just two photographs from the uh, launch complex at 39B. You can see the uh, space um, uh, Artemis 3 in the background with a, you know, I don't know if that's Artemis 3. Right? But that's, a shuttle. that's a shuttle. That's a shuttle, right? Yeah, the shuttle on the other side. Uh, so, yeah, space shuttle. And that's the size of the hydrogen in you. You know, quarter million tons of hydrogen. And there was a comment when I was checking it out, and to literally quote, taming liquid hydrogen is one of the most significant technical achievements of the 20th century American rocketry. That enabled the last five decades of space separate, uh, missions. But having done that guy, I want to go on to some uh, other uses that are also very valuable, but maybe not quite so dramatic. And the first is onboard space power system. You know, when you leave Earth orbit, there's no electrical plug to come into. You've got to start making your own power. And whether you use solar or whether you use onboard. And since the 60s, they have been using fuel cells. And I'll show you how that works in a minute. The primary one, the first ones were alkaline protein exchange ones. They use potassium hydroxide. And, uh, and then there's a polymeric fuel cell. These use hydrogen gas to react. There are higher temperature ones that do other. Both of these have flown on many space missions and, and a variety of time. So this is just an example. So how does a alkaline metal fuel cell work? Here's a summary. In one, hydrogen comes in as a gas, not particularly high atmosphere. Uh, on side four, then port four, oxygen come in. There's a, uh, cathode here, and uh, 
uh, uh, uh, anode here, those are electro. The, uh, there's an electrolyte in the middle that allows the hydrogen to be split into, uh, uh, to react to form uh, water. And that water is then, uh, and, uh, water is, and then do that, there's an electrical circuit that flows. This is your electric power. And the byproduct, particularly on things like Apollo, was water that the astronauts drank. And they used it on the space shuttle to make some of that too. Uh, now, these are the, uh, as I mentioned, it was 31%. They stored, on the Apollo show, 65 kilograms of cryogenic hydrogen to produce the energy. The space shuttle used up to 210 kilograms of hydrogen. Again, cryogenic. These are doors. I actually uh, took these photographs down at the uh, Space Center in Atlanta uh, to, when I toured it a few years back because I knew that was hydrogen. Now, the other alternative that had been used for a long time was nickel hydrogen batteries. These, this is the reaction, nickel hydroxide with gaseous hydrogen to form nickel hydroxide. These are not nickel, nickel metal hydride batteries that have been on you know, cell phones and computers and in car batteries back about a decade or so. That's a different process. That's a metal hydride process, but it's not the one that was used in space. This electrochemical charge was very durable and, and highly cyclable. And in fact, these were the ones that were used for up to 40,000 cycles in like the International Space Station, the Hubble Space Telescope. And again, you have gaseous hydrogen in here. Uh, this is just an example of a uh, of a drawing of their construction. The people at JPL, uh, JPL, JPL uh, Jet Propulsion Lab, worked a long time on these things, and I interacted with several of the people there as we were looking at that. But starting in late 2010, the advancement of lithium-ion batteries were sufficient that most of the uh, nickel-hydrogen batteries, which have high-pressure hydrogen in them and, and concerns, were replaced. So. As far as I know, there's not been any nickel metal hydride batteries, although they could be viable for specialized miss missions, but I'm not aware of any. So what I want to talk about now is the uh, first use of a metal hydride in space exploration. And that was a Huygens probe on the Cassini mission to Saturn in the early 2000s. So that's the uh, Cassini spacecraft drawing. And that, of course, Saturn got rings, right? big rings, not little rings like Uranus, but big rings. And what they wanted to do is that there was a great deal of interest on the atmosphere of Titan, the large moon of Saturn, about what it was composed of and what it was doing, because there were suggestions that could actually support some kind of life. And so starting in the 80s and 90s, they wanted to do chemical analysis of that gas. And now you can't just walk up there and do it. And so what they did is they uh, uh, I think it was mostly at, uh, at Goddard, but uh, uh, a collaboration with the European on the Huygens space probe. That was carried along, piggybacked on Cassini, and then sent uh, into orbit and actually landed on the surface of Titan. And it was uh, launched in October of 97. Took it uh, almost seven years, 2004, to, to get to, to Saturn. It's a long way. And they descended on the 14th of January, 2005, and that gas chromatograph instrument operated for 226 minutes, uh, collecting gas samples and being analyzed on site of what the compositions were. And in order to do that, they needed a reference gas. And hydrogen is simplest gas and was made very pure by being stored in a metal hydride. So what was done is this is the manifold that was in their gas spectrometer, and it used a small two small canisters of, of cerium-free mishmetal nickel-5 hydride. It's a an AB5 type hydride, uh, and it was developed at the Energe Energenics Corporation that used to be in New Jersey, and it would prepare space there, and it stored seven and a half standard liters of hydrogen. 
that ran through the instrument. They collected the data on the composition analyzed. I'm not showing it here, but if you're interested, there are reports, all kinds of description of what they found. Didn't find any living critters though. But a lot of a lot of gas composition. So that was the first actual implementation of a metal hydride on a real space mission. Not just talking about it, planning for it. So now I'm going to transition to another aspect of hydrogen, and that's being hydrogen being cool. That is cryogenics. Cryogenics is basically anything below 100 Kelvin, pretty much. Ice water is not cryogenic. It's cold, but it's not cryogenic. Hydrogen has to be cooled below 253 degrees Celsius to go from a gas to a liquid at atmospheric pressure. Uh, and that's cold. And it has to be handled, has lots of ways to lose heat. Uh, this is R for people with chemistry background who likes phase diagrams. It's a phase diagram of hydrogen, pure molecular H2 hydrogen. And this uh, x-axis is temperature in Kelvin. You'll see we start at minus 175 Kelvin. Room temperature is, a, you know, another 100 plus degrees over here, zero. Going down uh, uh, here is at 13.9. This is absolute zero. This is pressure. Now it's in bars, so it's 50 bars, 50 atmospheres pressure, the metric unit for there. Uh, the supercritical phase is that at temperatures uh, above 33 degrees Kelvin and 15 bar pressure will be a high pressure gas. It won't liquefy. However, if you either lower the temperature or lower the pressure, you will have a liquid phase. If you, if you keep the pressure up, you'll have a compressible liquid. That is, you push on it, but it's still liquid phase. Finally, if you get it cold enough, which is just 14 degrees Kelvin, uh, it will turn into a solid. It's at the triple point. It goes, depends on the composition, but it, below that temperature, it's solid hydrogen. The only thing that condenses lower than that is helium, helium-4. And it doesn't solidify, it turns to a liquid that stays liquid to absolute zero, or near absolute, millikelvin. So if you want to study cryogenics on really, really cold stuff, look up helium. So this is the thermodynamics of hydrogen and how it can work for coal. Well, rocket scientists and space fish don't really care about that. They want to do missions, and they want to do missions uh, of certain type where they need instruments. And there were two missions that used solid hydrogen cryostat, thermos bottles, great big thermos bottles. Uh, and one was in 1996 called Spirit 3. And that was for the BM, uh, DO, SDO. Yeah, well, Missile, Missile Defense Organization, Star Wars. And they were doing an experiment where they wanted to track uh, satellites after they had burned out their fuel and long infrared radiation. To do that, you needed infrared sensors at cryogenic temperature. That is below that, on the order of 10 Kelvin or so, 9 Kelvin. So what they did to do that test to see the feasibility is they built a big door at 80 kilograms of hydrogen frozen to 9 Kelvin. And then they had aluminum foam because, you know, to conduct the heat in and out. And it was the first one to measure that. It launched in 1996. It flew for almost an hour in Earth orbit, took data, and then guess what? The Russians gave up and they didn't do Star Wars anymore. But it, it was used for that. It was used for that mission. There was a scientific mission that came on a few years later, and it's called a Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer. What they wanted to do was to map the entire sky in the infrared, infrared wavelengths with more sensitivity and, re and resolution than had been done before. And to do that, they needed detectors that were cooled below 15 Kelvin. And they wanted to use a solid hydrogen door. And they had they built this. This is a wise with two-stage cryostat to cool it. Had almost 16 kilograms of hydrogen. It launched on a Delta II rocket, which of course used hydrogen to get it up. Uh, and started its first survey. It took data for almost a year, and then it ran out of solid hydrogen. 
So it couldn't run no sensors anymore because it warmed up too much. And so for two years, pretty much, it sat around not doing much. And then they decided that they wanted to uh, look for near-Earth asteroids, you know, in case something would come hit the Earth. And they decided they could use the nearer infrared uh, uh, detectors, which didn't require cryogenic cool, and they were cold enough on the satellite. So they started doing that mission in the mid-2015. Uh, and they ran it for several years. I don't know if it's still running or not. But uh, so that this is a cross setting. You see the, the solid hydrogen cryostat and all of so that was built and flown using solid hydrogen. Well, since I like phase diagrams, I'm going to give you another one. So this is temperature in the pressure enthalpy phase diagram. Not pressure composition, but enthalpy. Chemists knows what that are. Maybe even engineers do. I doubt if many physicists do, but that's a different story. And this is called Joule-Thompson expansion. You remember early on I talked about uh, the discovery of, of, of pressurized uh, expansion of gas uh, uh, producing cooling releasing energy and producing cooling. Well, all gases have their own coefficient, so does hydrogen. So this is enthalpy, which you know, proportional. This is pressure involved. This is units of kilopascals. 100 kilopascals uh, is one bar, one atmosphere. Uh, 100 atmospheres is something on the order of uh, uh, 5,000 bar pressure. And if you drop down to one millibar, so you're going in you know, orders of magnitude pressure, you get down to lower temperatures. So if you have hydrogen at frequent, and these are these funny little curves are isotherm. That is their fixed temperature as a function of, of enthalpy and pressure. But if you start hydrogen um, uh, at a cold enough temperature, that is, you know, somewhere above its critical point, and then drop the pressure. You go to the critical point at 33, what that does is that changes from a gas to a mixture of a liquid and, a, and gas and goes down all the way to 14. Then you're at the triple point. Below that you have vapor and solid. And of all higher enthalpy, all these things. But in this regime, you can produce cold temperature starting at an intermediate temperature. No moving parts, nothing else will just produce cold. And as long as you keep flowing gas, it will stay cold. And there were reasons even uh, 60 years ago for that. Maybe, and that was going to Mars. And at Mars, you wanted to know what the atmosphere of Mars was. This was long before you knew what the atmosphere uh, worried about when Titan, but they were worried about Mars. They thought there might be people on Mars. They wanted to know what, they were, what gas they had. And so they needed. Uh, a way to cool their detector, to monitor, survey, and they launched two uh, flights, Mar Mariner 6 and 7. Both of them used mid-infrared cameras to determine the composition of the atmosphere and also the solid. So this is the copy of the, or a drawing of the, of the instruments, 6 and 7, it looked almost the same. And this is a chromatic, and this little red arrow, which I think you can see, that's where the instrument was, and that's where they had a Joule Thompson cryocore to cool that system. And of course, you do anything on a satellite, it's not trivial. This is what it was a two stage open cycle, uh, at first condensed by Joule Thompson nitrogen. You know, nitrogen is what, 80% of the air. If you drop nitrogen uh, and do Joule Thompson expansion, you'll get to about 77 Kelvin, Kelvin at atmospheric pressure. And then if you uh, then uh, take the hydrogen, or, or you, well that's actually expansion of nitrogen, you run through an interface, so you cool the uh, gas running through that, in this case hydrogen, down to 77, and then you uh, do Joule-Thompson expansion of the hydrogen, actually I think I'm a little confused, I think it was helium they were cooling, but anyway, that's, I want to talk about the hydrogen you produce, hydrogen, and what they did is they didn't keep the hydrogen, they bended it to the atmosphere, but they, they kept flowing the gas in. And so the total weight of the, of the system, the electronics was about uh, well, 17 kilograms for the whole instrument. The 
electronics were about 11, the gas system, that's the liquid nitrogen, liquid hydrogen station. And so both flew, and the status of them is, these are what they, what they flew in 1969. The Jewel Thompson uh, valve or condenser uh, plugged. They couldn't get any colder. They couldn't cool any further. So they took 108 source wave infrared spectra. On the second one, both of the Jewel Thompson worked. It cooled the long wave infrared detector to 22 Kelvin, which is fairly long wave, got 130 spectra, and during a 27 minute recording period, they took the pictures the first ever, and it was to quote somebody else, a chemistry professor, and, and the infrared spectrometer was a groundbreaking design of unprecedented sensitivity and mechanical stability and environmental robustness, which enabled to make the first chemical measurement of the makeup of Mars' surface and atmosphere. So, somebody thought. So what did we, what, summary what we learned. We learned what the composition of, of Mars' atmosphere, a lot of CO2. Determine the vapor composition as a function of, 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 uh, of rain. Measured evidence that there was solid carbon dioxide. You, you learn this by knowing the vibrational spectrum of the molecule. They, they observed solid water and water hydrates on the Martian, sur Martian, Mar Martian surface, which is very handy if you're going to go to Mars and want some water. At least it says there's some there. And they detected uh, geotype, which is a evidence of weathering. It's a, it's a mineral form that requires water in it formation. So it said there have been water once upon, liquid water on Mars at one time. So this was the information. They used other instruments now, and as you know, they got rovers running around Mars. And other than getting launched with hydrogen station, uh, so far they haven't used hydrogen, but I'll mention a couple things in the future. Okay, back to one more principle, <coughs> and that is the hydrogen absorption <coughs> cryocoolers uh, where you want to produce liquid hydrogen or solid hydrogen using metal hydrides. <coughs> and the schematic concept is here. You have uh, a gas coming in at pre-cooled to 80 degrees, whether it's a mechanical refrigerator or some other device that you have. You have high pressure hydrogen come in. Uh, it's being absorbed and the uh, the high pressure gas flows this way in through a Jewel Thompson valve. It cools, liquefies, or solidifies into a pool. That hydrogen boils off. You keep the pressure low by having it being absorbed by a hydride. There's a heat switch that isolates it, that you can heat it and cool it. So this is a heat switch that, that would do that. This is based on the thermal cycle of a metal hydride. If low temperature, for example, low but not being cryogenic, but room temperature, the metal will absorb hydrogen to, no, oh, come on, you don't want to do that. It will uh, absorb hydrogen to a composition. Uh, it turns out many metal hydrides have relatively <coughs> flat pressures over a change of composition, so it kind of controls temperature. You heat it up to maybe 500 degrees C on the little reactor, not the, <coughs> desorb it, it then uh, has high pressure, you can then take that back through the Joule Thompson valve, produce cooling. And there are two examples that I worked on and on doing that. One's a brilliant eye, 10 Kelvin absorption uh, experiment called BESI by nickname, acronym. And it flew on the space shuttle, shuttle in 1996. Recall I told you I like that picture of the space shuttle being launched in 1996? It flew on that one. The other one is a Planck absorption cryocooler that was launched in 2009. And they were again led, developed by JPL. I worked at Aerojet on the first one, and I was a JPL employee on the second one. So the big question is, why do you want to have a fast cool down in space? Remember BMDO? Back in the 60s, they worry about missiles. And what they wanted was, how do you track if the nasty Soviet Union send a, a warhead out and launches? You can track it uh, with the heat coming off of the rocket. But once it clears atmosphere, temperature drops to not much more than room temperature. None of the uh, short wave, medium wave infrared detectors could detect it. Long wavelength could. However, the best 
Most sensitive long wavelength infrared detectors were silicon based and operated only at temperatures below 12 Kelvin. Guess we're higher than solidified, 10 Kelvin. And so you needed, in a launch, you don't have a whole lot of time. They launch, in, from time of launch, in about two minutes, the, the, you need to cool it through there, keep it cold for at least 10 minutes, come, then cycle back to bring it back to temperature in case you do another one. Because what it would do, it was the short one would detect the boost, the, the mid-wavelength, the ones that were cooled by there, and they would track it and hopefully send something down to shoot it down. If not, the missiles were coming here. Well, uh, that was the scenario in the uh, mid-1990s. We, we started early 1990s. And this was the uh, device that was developed to actually test the concept. The concept was there, it was been proposed, but you know, a concept is not an experiment. A concept is not operation. So JPL got money from the Air Force and they built this uh, Betsy Cryocore uh, and, the, and the flight uh, cooler system. There's Stephen Bard. That kind of gives you the scale of this. And again, they used two uh, metal hydride, a lanthanum nickel tin hydride, and a uh, zirconium nickel hydride, where this hydride, lanthanum nickel 5, would allow you to pressurize hydrogen to approximately 100 atmosphere. It would go through a heat exchanger to cool down by a, a mechanical one. Then the JT valve would drop it to about 20 Kelvin. That valve would close, and the valve to a uh, zirconium nickel bed, which had a pressure over a thousand times lower than absorption pressure than uh, the, the, the lanthanum nickel tin, would suck gas out and take that liquid and freeze part of it. It would freeze it to 10 Kelvin. And so that 10 Kelvin then, at 0.13 uh, kilopascals, that's like below a torr pressure. And that, that's how it would work. And all of this had to happen in less than two minutes from when it, you turned the button on. Well, I was at Aerojet then, I got hired there, and I led the hydride development effort for this project. And I obtained, helped characterize, lanthanum nickel tin, we worked on loading the beds, building them. We did the zirconium nickel. We built that, tested it, studied its lifetime, lots and lots of uh, characterization to make it work. Uh, this is the actual components of the three hydride bed. In order to change it fast enough, you had to have an intermediate bed to store it, and a fast absorbing bed to drop the pressure really quick, and then a zirconium nickel bed. And so that was the hardware that went into there. Uh, just to show you that, you know, the concept's not pretty straightforward. This is the hardware. This is the schematic of hardware. All the valves, all the plumbing, all the things it required to make it operate. In here was the door. Down here was where the uh, uh, solid hydrogen was formed and kept. And then they were testing it with a heater. Uh, it was put on the wall of the bay wall of the space shuttle in May of 1996. You know, by then, Star Wars was over, but it was NASA decided that it was a lot of technology meant they run tests for feasibility for future use. So we, it was loaded. Uh, it was launched from uh, um, Kennedy site. It went into Earth orbit. And so this is a schematic of the pressure, uh, temperature change where uh, this is kind of a blow up where you start to open the valve, pressure dropped, it condensed by Joule Thompson expansion, gaseous hydrogen to liquid hydrogen, about 20 Kelvin. You then close that valve, open the valve to the zirconium nickel, it dropped to 10 Kelvin. And so, and then it held that temperature until all the hydrogen had come off, the, all sublimed out of the system. So that was great, first test. However, the next series of tests never going to get below 20 Kelvin. And the reason was, after they flew on the space shuttle, after a few months, I was hired at JPL. I came there and I did the, led the testing of the post-flight system. And we took apart the valves, and it turns out this is the uh, valve that isolates that low-pressure zirconium nickel bed from the gas. Well, particles in zero gravity 
had floated in and, and stopped that valve from sealing tight. It worked just fine in the lab, and uh, uh, the uh, program manager said, well, that might be a problem, but we'll get by. Uh, it didn't, which is another a lesson I learned. That is, protect and clean valves. Don't trust particles. They'll go where you don't want them to go. So uh, again, there's been no follow-up to that, uh, but it worked. It was an, a, a neat flight. But there was another role, and I'm running on, but uh, not too much longer, I don't think. And that's the uh, cosmic microwave background radiation. That's the light left from the Big Bang 14 billion years ago. And the discovery and characterization of that by analysis tells you how the universe evolved. And in 2006, the Nobel Prize in Physics went to John Mather and George Smoot, both of whom I met in relationship to the project coming up. Uh, and this is the result of the Planck cosmic microwave background map. This is a map of the entire sky from the first map. And it measured that light. In order to do that, you needed very cold temperature for far infrared and radio transmission detectors. And the instrument that was developed starting in the mid 1995, mid 1990s, I came on board in 97, um, was a mission led by ESA, the European Space Agency, to measure that. And there were two instruments. The high frequency instrument was a radio detector, 100 gigahertz, 800. The low frequency was uh, infrared, 70 to uh, uh, 30 to 70 gigahertz. Well, the high uh, frequency instrument, which was, I'm sorry, I got to flip. The high frequency was the infrared barometer. They had to be at a tenth of a degree Kelvin, a tenth of a degree above absolute zero in order to collect the data that were needed. And the low frequency, the radios, they needed to be at 20 degrees Kelvin to have the sensitivity, stability, and all the other things. And so the, the Absorption cryocore was, was presented, pitched, argued, and developed to make the cooling system for both of these devices. It was the only cooling stage for the low frequency radio waves, and it was a first stage core for the, which used a helium mechanical refrigerator to 4 Kelvin, and then a helium 3 dilution refrigerator to get it to a 10th Kelvin. Uh, the Planck satellite was launched away from Earth. It was called the uh, a second Lagrangian. That's a place past the moon, but where you go as the Earth goes around the sun, this spot stays in space. So a satellite in there with a telescope pointed deep into space will map the entire sky over a period of several months. And this went through, uh, and it planning started, flew for four years, and uh, originally it was just going to fly 18 months, it flew a total of 53 months. Now, I mentioned that cryocore was needed for that instrument. So this is the uh, 20 Kelvin core made with uh, metal hydrides. Uh, this is the 4 Kelvin mechanical refrigerator built by some JPL led this issue. This is the uh, APD helium uh, 3 and 4 dilution refrigerator. Uh, and it all is described in detail. What you would do is the L5 would cool stages. You'd have radiators that would cool, pre-cool down to about 50 Kelvin in space. It's far away from the Earth, far away from the Moon. But then you have to take it that next temperature down, and it would, would go there. So that's the satellite, the actual uh, Planck satellite that you see on the, on the left side. These are the radiators placed. This is the telescope. Back buried on the side here were Two absorption cryo, two absorption cryo. They made two, a redundant. In first analysis, said one would work, but when you're spending a couple billion dollars on a mission, and if you don't have cryo, it's zero. They, we, they go two. And this is a schematic of all the components. These little circle guys are metal hydride beds. These are interfaces and radiator. Way down here uh, at the it would be in here is where the interface to the detectors are. And so that was there. The Planck 
really use these three radiators plus the heat exchanger and the Joule Thompson. This is the schematic, the cycle. There were six of the hydride beds, uh, and they're shown in here where they would be heated like a cylinder in a car. You would heat one, it would absorb gas, you cool it down, it absorbs gas, and you have six of them out of phase. So it just runs continually making liquid hydrogen at 20 Kelvin, 24-7. And that was the purpose. Um, one of the issues you had, of course, is you need power to heat them up. If you heat up the entire satellite, it's more power, the entire uh, absorption bed, the container, it's more power than the spacecraft can generate. So what you had to do is isolate it thermally during the heat up, but then cool it to cool back down with an inconducting uh, material to bring it back to room temperature. And as mentioned, when you absorb hydrogen, it's exothermic, it releases heat. You gotta pull that heat out, keep it cold so it will absorb the hydrogen. That cycle had to work. And in order to do that, we adapted uh, a technique called a gas gap heat switch. Uh, the gas gap heat switch works sort of like this. There's a, a hydride bed that you have the hydrogen being circulated through. You have a little actuator. This is the actuator. It uses a low pressure metal hydride that you heat up. And we went back to our old friend zirconium nickel because it worked and we could adapt it. And that's what we adapted to make these conductors. The difference is, as you change pressure, if you get to low pressure, your molecular uh, regime, you can change conductivity of very low value. You get up to the viscous region, which is literally only a few tor. tor. You now conduct very fast, because hydrogen has the highest thermal conductivity of any uh, molecular species. So we did engineering, we did design, we did development. This is the uh, blow up of that technique. Here again, this is hydrogen. It has a better continuum heat conductivity than helium, or more in order to magnitude better than air or here. Again, we have a very small gap. The gap, whoop, do do? this gap is 0.75 millimeters, separates the bed from the other. Uh, the lanthanum nickel tin is in here, the zirconium nickel here. This is the profile of that inner bed has to be heated from just about room temperature up to uh, uh, about 450 Kelvin, 200 degrees C. And so you would, as I said, you would isolate it here and by having the gas cap closed, providing vacuum, you then heat it up, you then connect by putting some gas, hydrogen pressure in this gap, it cools it down, and then absorbs the heat, and it changes conductivity. So here's the change in, 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 in heat conductivity. This is the pressure at 500 degree Kelvin, we have something in order of 10 bar, 10 millibar. At uh, room temperature, it's four orders of magnitude lower. Pretty decent vacuum. And so we had to develop it. There were functional requirements. You can only use so much power on a spacecraft, no big plugs. While they had you know, some solar energy, it was far away. They didn't get some power, but they were very limited by power. Had to run, had to operate thousands of cycles in doing all that. And so um, it was very critical not to have high pressure when it was in the off state, that didn't was conducting. Because it, you needed that low pressure, otherwise you have a heat leak. Heat leaks means you lose power to your system. We developed a prototype, actually we tested it on a, what we call an engineering breadboard, did extensive cycling, and, and we used a small amount because we were trading off of 0.28 grams, and it cycled and it, it worked okay, but when we tested the actual unit in lab test, it was outgassing more hydrogen than this could handle. And so we had to redesign and make it bigger. So what we did is we made a 10, 10 size larger, so it's 2.8 grams, and we also evacuated, there was originally gold coating. I got one engineer said, oh, gold's good, it reflects. It also emits gases like hydrogen out of it because it's electrochemically deposited. So we took polish uh, 316L as a surface, ultrafine, passivated, and made it out of that. And it slowed it down. There's also this very uncomfortable, you have uh, 
10 to 100 atmospheres hydrogen on the inside of your bed, it will permeate through stainless steel at a couple hundred degrees C. Not a lot, but when you run thousands of hours, it does one. So anyway, we did that. We, we got it would work. My personal grudge is that we got it all work. We tested the system out, the individual bed. And then our uh, JPL project manager said, well, it's going to be a lot easier if we just close off these things and then integrate them in. This, and then, but then they had to do flight tests and so forth. Well, there was a problem. After you did the flight test, they released hydrogen into the gas gap. And there's a consequence for that that I'll point out. So this is what was at JPL. We, this is six of the compressor elements, that's the hydride bed, for one of the cryocores. And we built another six. And we have a couple spares. I even have a couple in my garage <laughs> liberated. I'm not sure what I'm going to do with it, but I do have it. Uh, they were integrated in the core. It was tested in the lab. Again, this is the uh, baffle. They had to keep the refrigerator. I mean, the, the, the telescope cold. They had the shoe. The hydride beds were down in here. That's when it was launched on, on the, uh, uh, not the space shuttle this time, but on the Ariane 5 by ESA in, in South America. I didn't go to that one either. But this is a summary of the flight data. There were two units. Flight model two was the one that went through a lot of ground testing, being regenerated, being tested, and so forth. And what that did is that it impacted the ability to thermally isolate that. And it, there was also degradation of the absorbent materials of all the cycles which characterized, which I, I report in this study. But again, there were those factors. So that by the end of a uh, little under a year, six months. Its parameters were, they had to heat it too hot to keep it cool. They had, it was just using too much power to use more power than they could, could operate. So they literally turned it off and went to our other core, the Flight Model 1. We, it had not been tested or put through things. Even though it had been sealed, there wasn't very much chance to generate prematurely hydrogen, or methane, a couple of other gases that we found in our study, and it ran for three years. It was still running, but it was losing efficiency. And so it operated to take measurements for the full length of time that Planck was operated. And the final measurements on that, on that instrument were in August of 2013. And they, in October, they uh, did in-flight test of the system, including the remaining operating cryocool. We also tested the other. And the flight control center was in Darmstadt, Germany. I went there for two weeks and worked on that. And, and we did tests. We did a regeneration procedure. We tested the bed. We looked at the capacity. We verified our numbers. And after all that was done, on October the 19th, I pressed the switch to cut off the power to the cryo core, and they didn't did core. Two days later, they cut off the power to the spacecraft, powered it up, and sent it into deep space. So it's never coming back home, but it's going out there for a long time, and a big piece of hardware. So, uh, so what can we say? You know, what it was developed from scratch a unique space mission to study one of the key astrophysics, cosmological uh, uh, mysteries of the universe. It me measured the cosmic mag ray for over 50 months. They got tons of data, lots of interpretation. Go to the website for Planck and cosmic microwave background. You can read dozens of papers of what it says. Uh, we did need both cores because one got degraded but it did work. We do know how to build better, longer life cores that would work. Uh, no one's asked yet, but it doesn't mean they won't. But, so now having done what has been done in flight, I want to spend a little time uh, about future roles. Not spend so much time, but cover a few topics. One is that since the 1950s, and certainly for 20 years, there were going to be fission thermal rockets. And this is a NERVA program. They actually demonstrated at the 
uh, Huntsville, Alabama Rocket Center photograph I took of how it's supposed to work. And again, you see the fuel or the propellant is hydrogen. Gaseous hydrogen run through a nuclear fission reactor. There's a, another technique where you can use a radiator and use xenon gas, rare through an electronic uh, propulsor. You need this thrust so it would work. There are concepts, there's at least three different types that have been discussed, proposed, minimal testing, uh, solid core, fission, an open cycle, a closed cycle. All of them work on the principle of bringing hydrogen in at low temperature and pressure and spitting out hydrogen at high temperature and pressure for a long time. Besides the use of hydrogen on that, you have lots of neutrons and lots of other things. One of the things that hydrogen is very good for is reducing energy and scattering of neutrons. And so it absorbs their energy, slows them down, prevents them from doing terrible things. Like if you have astronauts near a reactor in a part of a satellite, you don't want to be neutron irradiated for several months. So stable hydrides like titanium and zirconium and lithium were investigated, considered in designs over the years. There are you know, reports on those. Uh, after the 1970s, fission reactor technology pretty much died away. They were doing space shuttle and, you know, the other things, but things completely go away. But then when they want to go to Mars, go somewhere else, you need something else. And the 19, late uh, 2015 or so, uh, they proposed that well, to go to Mars in a, in a practical time, a, a thermonuclear system would be best. And so some feasibility studies were offered or put out and proposed for proposals. There were three of them that were awarded about a year ago. Uh, concept studies for $5 million each. One was BSW Technology, partnering with Lockheed, General Atomics in San Diego with X Energy and Aerojet, and it's ultrasafe nuclear technology of Seattle. It's not, I think it's some spin-off of Boeing with Blue Origin, Geno Rectory, you know, a variety of things. So these are all feasibility studies. I looked this week, I haven't seen any new reports of where they're going, but they are at least underway for being proposed. There are also within NASA a number of studies and within DOE. There's uh, the Marshall Space Center is doing the primary one. The DOE facility, which has a big lead, Idaho has a, has a big lead, Oak Ridge National Lab and Los Alamos have parts. Other NASA centers like Glenn and Cleveland and Stennis are also carrying parts. And there are universities and other companies from MIT to uh, Aerojet to others. And each one is looking at some portion or, or, or part of it. The latest kind of concept it is here where you uh, have hydrogen propellant uh, coming in from some source, cryogenic hydrogen most likely, and go through the reactor, which is here, get heated up and spit out there. This is where those components that insulate, moderate, slow down, things like zirconium nickel, I mean zirconium hydride, sorry, zirconium nickel, zirconium hydride or lithium hydride or some other material. Again, to compare why this is interesting, you know, early on I said, chemical reaction, the best, is hydrogen and oxygen. It has a specific impulse of about 460. It has a mass ratio to escape Earth of 15 times. You need 15 times more mass of the rocket than what you're sending into space. If you do fission reactors with hydrogen heated by some type of coal or a Morton coal, you can get specific impulses that are two to ten times greater and reduce the mass down to one and a half to two. Those are all very attractive if you want to go far enough and fast enough. There are concepts like direct fusion where you just use the energy of fusion to throw particles out. That gets really good, but no one's to tie on anymore and talk about. There is, of course, one other option, and that's thermonuclear fusion. Deuterium and tritium bonding together, fusion, it would work. There's even a further concept, annihilation of matter. Antimatter and matter. All you do is make some of this stuff. Put it together so it can go. Uh, 
I'm not saying any more about it. I mean, but for fusion, there have been two concepts talked about off and on, analyzed. Nothing has been built to demonstrate. But these are the reactions, deuterium and tritium, to make an alpha particle and a neutron. Lots of energy, a lot of that energy comes off in those neutrons. And so deuterium, but again, these have you know, low efficiency, high crop section, high temperature. Uh, one is steady state, you put in the fusion reactor and you keep making it. And, you know, uh, there's a uh, pulse, an in, in initial uh, fusion reactor from Pellet. Those of you maybe in more, uh, Lawrence Livermore have been going for 30 years on doing fusion power using uh, laser beam inter, uh, interaction of, of deuterium tritium. That doesn't, hasn't worked yet either. But again, this fuel could be deuterium tritium gas or lithium deuteride tritide. You see, there's another reaction up here of deuterium and lithium-6. This would use lithium-6. That would give you more bang for your buck, a concept. But as I said, a lot of analyze. I think there's going to be any missions are going to be decades, centuries, I don't know, a long time. It's very hard. It's big. But then again, science fiction is very popular with a lot of people. So getting away from science fiction is something that may have more of a shot. And this is electrolysis to generate water or oxygen and hydrogen from water or from, and this is uh, kind of the reverse of, you know, like a fuel cell. Fuel cell makes water. Uh, you can take water and break it up. We've had other reports. And so, and these are things like life support systems. You know, you take recovered water, it comes there, convert it back into oxygen. People like to breathe oxygen. They don't want to breathe water very long. You can make energy to make rocket fuel if you're on the Mars, but it doesn't have any. So you can make new rocket fuel over a period of time and come back. And then there's in, in situ resource recovery. Those are the same thing. This is kind of a eye chart, but it talks about your moon, you want uh, uh, water, bring the hydrogen, you, you make it. Mars, asteroids. You know, they go study asteroids, they're good. They're all these purposes, they are. Feasible. There's some small tests that have been, I think, done on a, on a couple missions. About 20 years ago, there was a. I was involved with a feasibility study at JPL between doing the Betsy work and going into the uh, Planck core, and we did a, a, an analysis study and some things for a while. Uh, we looked at some roles that metal hydride could do for storage tanks and how you could bring it in. And we wrote a report or two, and it didn't go anywhere, but. We did do that, and it's still feasible. Somebody wants to do it. But there's a new application for hydrogen. It was just published in a paper earlier this year by three JPL and Caltech friends of mine. I think they're still my friends. Uh, I talked to them once in a while. Uh, and that is, well, you know, Venus is a hot place to go to. It has a very thick, heavy atmosphere, and there's a lot of mysteries about that. And not only is it interesting hot, it's chemically hot. And so one of the ways is that they thought they might be able to study that and the range of atmospheric from is to use balloons. Not just any ordinary balloon, but balloons that could use hydrogen to lift them. They have, you know, mostly CO2 and other stuff in Venus, methane. Hydrogen is very light, it'll float. You store it in a metal hydride, it's very compact. So you can heat and cool it and make it float, change, change altitude and so forth. So they did a study for storing it. They used compressed gas, you know. This is a concept in the paper they studied uh, the, the, uh, to, to, to do that. Uh, the parameters, they had uh, an oxide, a fuel cell port, uh, an oxide, oxide they, have, they have high temperatures, they can use high temperature fuel cell. Water pump, metal hydride container right in, it's, it's buried right in here. Uh, so they did a drawing and a study. They looked at candidate alloys. These are ones that we looked at. Palladium hydrogen, lanthanum nickel five, zirconium and these are alloys. Again, you would use this same kind of cycle. Store hydrogen at a relatively low temperature, 
heat it up, get high pressure, provide that. The thermodynamics is driven, given by enthalpy and that. And these are kind of a quick plot of the pressure ratios. You can, you can adjust composition to match temperature to, to get what you want to, what you think you would need. And so that's, again, a, a new feasibility study. I don't know where it's going to go, but maybe. So to kind of wrap up, the role of hydrogen has been launching spacecraft. Variety of time, shuttles and so forth. There are the new designs being built and done. Fuel cells have been used a long time. There may be a role, more roles for metal hydride. The nickel hydrogen batteries are probably replaced. There might be some nickel metal hydride. But again, there's a lot of um, energy conversion. I don't think there's going to be absorption cryocore, although there's a couple of studies that are being done. The Europeans are following up a couple. These gas gap heat switches, they could be used for something else, where you have a thermal environment and you know, they might work in, on, 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 on Venus or somewhere else. The reference gas is relatively efficient. If you wanted to take that and do uh, spectroscopy by mass spec or something, you could. And of course, there's a possibility of using hydrogen balloons that go on Venus or somewhere else. That's kind of the second aspect is, you know, you can take hydrogen and then make atmosphere in Mars, uh, it being talked about. The uh, ISRU by Water Level Trust is certainly being looked at again. Fission involved hydrogen and hydride. But, you know, it's getting looked at again. There's, there's a lot of motivation, again, to, to use it. Fusion, I think, is still a long, long way off. It's just too daunting, too many issues. But before I finish, 20 years ago, I was dead in working on metal hydride absorption bed for cryogenic refrigerators at JPL for space. Now, many of you know my wife, Judy. She was an art teacher. And I tried to explain what, she, what I was doing with my 60 to 90 hour work weeks. <laughs> and I said, well, I make metal hydride beds for refrigerators to fly in space. And this is her drawing of what I did. It looks a lot like a Kenmore in a kind of big bed, but it has a JPL logo. And so uh, 